try to get you out of the wind. It's just, it's not as windy today as it was yesterday. No. We're both sunburned. Look how sun red you are. Mm -hmm, I'm a little red. <laughs> Hi, it's Dr. Jamie Pendleton with my husband, Dr. John Pendleton, and we are back with Maranatha Minutes. Again, we have the sun in our eyes. We're at another picnic table, but on the other side of this hill. We're hoping that will help the wind problem. And ah, I've got to have my sunglasses. There we go. And water. <laughs> we hiked uh, probably about uh, one and a half miles to get to this side. That's not too bad. That's what it felt like three. <laughs> Maybe five. <laughs> Alright, so I think it's calmer. If the if the wind comes along, we'll just not say anything until the wind passes. How's okay. that? Yeah. Maybe then you can hear us. <laughs> I'm still gonna post the other video. Maybe you'll get something out of it. The next time I'll bring my wireless mic so it will at least pick us up. But I think the wind was too strong. I, I really think that it would have Yeah, I would have picked pick it up that way too. Yeah. That's the fish jumping. <laughs> okay, so yesterday we talked about how we can use our senses to create a better season ahead for ourselves. So bringing in song and singing and things like that, and just bringing in some cheer and some joyful uh, music and stuff to help lift us in our pain and our suffering and in our winter blues. Okay, that's what we talked about yesterday. Now today, let me get to where my heart is at. I was praying and just up there relaxing on the hill because we were tired from making our way around. <laughs> I took a nap. <laughs> yeah. We were supposed to have a meetup today with um, with a fellow camper. But we actually originally met here at Raccoon Lake. Yes. You can hear the nature and the birds today. Yeah, it's definitely a squirrel. Mm -hmm. I might have to bring you a little closer. I think I'm, you're, I'm trying to get you as close as possible, but not so easy up on this hill where we're at. So. All right, so today I wanted to talk about the nature of true um, apostleship. And I think John has some things to say about this, but I'm just going to quickly read uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 uh, Corinthians 4. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted in the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My own conscience is clear. But that does not make me innocent. It makes me forgiven, doesn't it? Because we know, we know we're forgiven in Christ. Mm -hmm. We know that he died for our inequities. We know that we are sinners. I had someone once tell me, well, once you are faith, if you ever sin again, you're going to hell because God's not going to keep forgiving you. Well, we're in the times of Jubilee and they just don't understand that. It's not an excuse to go out and sin. It is a reason to say that God loves us and he does forgive us and that we are not perfect. But that doesn't mean to go out and to be unfaithful to God and to your spouse and to whoever just because you can and you think he'll forgive you. That's not how it works. God knows our hearts. Yes. And it says in uh, 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is we don't walk in the ways of darkness. We may stumble uh, periodically, but we don't make that a habit or uh, a lifestyle. That's right. So your conscience is clear, meaning? Well, in, in reference to things, the, the devil is the accuser. So those things that uh, Paul was a killer of Christians and uh, actually put Christians in prison and actually was destroying the church very effectively in the first century until he met Jesus and his life changed. Paul was the most unlikely person to become a Christian in his era. Um, he would be like the chief atheist today becoming a, a Christian. And there are atheists that turn their life over to Christ uh, because they see the truth. And uh, when you see something like that transform somebody, you know that there's uh, the power of God at work. 
And even Paul, they started even worshiping Paul. And Paul said, don't worship me. Don't worship Apollo. Don't worship the people of our times or beyond our times and before our times. Worship the Christ. Yes. Who died on the cross for you? Was it me, Paul? Was it Apollo? Was it uh, John or Peter or Mark? No, it was Christ. So even he made it very clear he, who you were to worship. That means Jesus was God in the flesh, and they believed it too. Yes, they did. So if somebody tells you that they said that the apostles didn't believe that or never said that, that's absolutely not true. So um, so then we start here on uh, Corinthian, 1 Corinthians uh, 4, 6. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your belief or for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. In other words, dividing the church. One preacher's right, one preacher's wrong. They talked about division of the church right here. That's not what God intended. Nobody has their special little secret. If they're preaching something beyond what's inside this Bible, then they're adding doctrine to the Bible. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's not right. Uh, and it's not a health, wealth, prosperity gospel either. And we talked about that yesterday. For who makes you different from anyone else? What uh, do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Well, the gospel is the gospel. Once delivered to the saints, and it's happened in a real place, at a real time, in a real event, you can't make it up. It's not something that anybody made up. It's a reality that happened. The good, bad, and the ugly. Yes. It's in here. God wanted us to have an instruction manual on how to live our lives, and he wanted to give examples of things we should and should not be doing, and how things did and did not work for others. Yes. Look at all the eagles up there flying. One, two, three, four of them. Oh, I wish I could turn the camera right now. Just maybe they'll come behind us here in a minute and you'll see them. So it says, do not go beyond what is written. I mean, you don't have to add anything to it. It's simply here for your instruction manual. The answers are in this book, in God's word. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Now here we are at 1 Corinthians 4, 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign. And without us, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as humans. We are fools for Christ. Hear what they're saying? We are fools for Christ. But you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, and we are in rags, and we are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world. Right up. The passage that Janie read, I think, is simply described in this. It says that we are fools for Christ. We are the scum of the earth as far as the apostles of the first century. The only thing that they would have had to do to make their life easier was to deny the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, everybody knows Jesus lived. Atheist, agnostic, whomever. Everybody knows that Jesus died. That's a reality and an actual fact that is, I think, uncontestable. 
the resurrection of Jesus is in this same line. They put guards around the tomb. They sealed the tomb with a Roman seal, which meant death to anyone that interfered or did anything in reference to the body of Christ. And the body was gone. There was no reason and no explanation beyond the resurrection of Christ to account for the empty tomb. So that's a reality. And Jesus hung around for another 40 days and preached and taught the apostles and gave them instruction. That is what they would have had to deny and their life uh, would have been easier. The problem is, is that by denying it, we become something other than what we need to be. And in Christ, God doesn't just sit on a throne and up there looking and poking at people and making things hard for us. Everybody has trouble. We all are in this world and we're all going to have to die. But the reality is the only hope that's offered is that God became a man that dwelt among us and that lived and experienced what we experienced, died a horrible death on the cross and understands our situation. Not all the answers are given this side of the, uh, of the renewing of the heavens and the earth. But God does promise when that happens, we'll have our tears dried. And we do have the hope that no one else offers is there is a hope you'll see your loved ones again. You'll, you can know that in Christ. You can't know that in any other philosophy. You just live a little while and you die. The reality of the cross is true. We are fools for Christ in a lot of people's eyes. We are the scum of the earth, but the scum of the earth, the course of Western civilization, legally, socially, scientifically. economically, scientifically, politically, and in every other way. And people want to replace what happened and the hard uh, lessons that we've learned in the church with paganism and all kinds of isms. And the only thing that I know that is offering hope is none of that. It's only Christ. Teach them to someone else. Sing them around the kitchen and let your grandchildren hear you sing songs of praise. Because this is how they'll grow up and they'll grow up singing them too. It's why I grew up singing them. It fills that void. You want to fill that void? If you want to talk to us, if you have some questions, you're fence sitting, or maybe you're at a church you're just not comfortable with, let us know. You don't have to let us know below this video. You can give us a private message. Okay. Love you. Love you, Jane. Here we go. Another location. This one sure was pretty. Let me zoom you guys around before the battery goes out. There we go. There's the cabin, and it's got a fireplace in it, and you can see Lexi running around up here. Here's the lake. And you can see the hawks. This lake is just so huge. There's a bunch of trailers John parked over there. Look. Are there? Yeah, it must be a private trailer park over there somewhere. Uh -huh. But right here in this little cove, this is where the fish are coming in and out. Now, the last time we were here, this was all flooded and filled up with water. You can see the, the lines here. It was pretty bad. But all through here is where the fish is. So we'll go tell them. We'll go tell them. All right. We love you guys. Go with God. Blessings. Blessings.